Welcome to episode one of From the Bleachers with me, MKT. And if you are listening to this, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, it's been a process coming towards starting the podcast, but we are here now, which is awesome. So just to tell you what's going to be happening in the future, it's going to be an episode a day, five days a week. So Monday to Friday, I will release an episode allowing you to catch up with the latest and greatest from indeed what is happening around the world of sport. So I don't want to get too much, uh, take too much with the intro, etc. What we're going to do is we're going to get straight into it. I'll tell you what I'm going to be talking about today. So I'm going to be talking about, of course, the biggest brand in the world, Manchester United. They have a problem at the moment, the Paul Pogba problem. Then we're going to talk about the Spurs uh, sp- stadium shambles. We saw the, the condition of the pitch and everybody had their say on that. And then, of course, we're going to talk about arguably the biggest football club in the world. Whilst uh, Man United may be the biggest brand, the biggest football club in the world, three times in a row champions, of course, Real Madrid of the Champions League, have just sacked their manager, Julien Lopetegui. And we're going to talk about that and exactly what my feelings are on that. Looking forward to hearing from guys out there exactly what they feel there. And then lastly, if you are a Springbok fan like myself, of course, Springboks uh, lost a nail-biting game to England. Um, everybody blaming Owen Farrell's tackle, etc., etc. We're going to dig into, into it a little bit. Is Malcolm Marks the hooker that should be playing for the Springboks? Is he a hooker at all? And um, is, he, is he international class in the crunch time? So we're going to get into that. Once again, so Pogba problem. We're going to talk about Spurs, a stadium shambles. Lost Lopetegui. Of course, Lopetegui being sacked at Real Madrid. And then Malcolm Marks and his somewhat meltdown against England over the weekend all right let's get into it we're going to get straight into the topic which is first and most interesting for me if so if you're into the premier league and are a man united fan i want you to remember one date the date is 20 february 2013 keep that date in mind 20 february 2013 the 20th of february in 2013 a certain a certain gentleman on that day, it was announced that he will leave Manchester United Football Club. And Manchester United Cl- Football Club has never been the same again. So I try and imagine Man United's um, sort of procession from 2013. Try and imagine this situation. You wake up in the morning. Your girlfriend breaks up with you. Right? At the breakfast table. You're reading the newspaper. And she says, honey, we need to talk. She says, it's over. Oh my goodness, you're heartbroken, but okay, the world must go on, you go to work, you get to the office, around 11 o'clock, you're having your first coffee, and your boss says, hey, pull into my office, take a seat, let's have a chat, and you get sacked on that very same day, so your girlfriend broke up with you, you got sacked at work, and then you head home, and when you get home, the girlfriend who dumped you in the morning is sleeping with your brother. That's what I look at Man United as having had since 2013. That is the situation that losing Alex Ferguson and David Gill all in one go, that is the situation. Man United went through the most massive trauma and it happened all together. Now, had they lost Fergie and Gill, let's say a year apart, two years apart, different story and you know that that's the thing about companies you know a lot of people are going oh my goodness we can't believe that man united are are, are what they are but actually companies are always talking to us and that's what man united are they're a company and they're always talking to you if you're willing to listen are you willing to listen Are are you are you looking at what they're doing they're talking to you they're telling you what their priorities are by the people they employ Man United decided to replace David Gill with Ed Woodward. Now, for those who don't know Ed Woodward, of course, when the new owners, uh, who are the Glazers, came into Manchester United, Ed Woodward at the time, of course, uh, he has an accounting um, background. He sort of was the guy who who was the liaison for the deal to happen for the Glazers and, and Man United's old ownership. And so he came in and he was in sort of... Uh, a vice executive management. He, he played a few roles within Manchester United. 
But then they replaced him in 2013. They replaced David Gill with Ed Woodward. And that was the moment for me. Like I said, companies are always talking to us. But that moment let me know what Manchester United were going to prioritize right from then onwards. Football is no longer the biggest game in town at Old Trafford. That is when you knew Man United became a business over a football club. Edward Wood is nowhere near what David Gill was. Now, when you lose Alex Ferguson, and then you lose the guy who you never, ever heard from. I've heard more about Ed Woodward than I've ever heard about David Gill in his tenure. And Gill was there for a long time. I mean, we're talking like intrinsically with everything he did before. It's probably about 20 years that David Gill spent interacting with Manchester United. Besides his days at Price Waterhouse Coopers, remember he came from an accounting background, he was 20 years attached to the football club. Ed Woodward's speciality, and he's shown us, has been the business side. Man United have never been more profitable. The Chevrolet deal, of course, they advertised that and couldn't wait to tell the world that that is the biggest deal in the world. And Ed Woodward showed us that it is now business over football. The transfer business at Manchester United. And that is always the best indicator of what your guy is like. David Gill, there was a time at Manchester United when you'd go to yourself, oh, who are Man United signing this season? They've just won a title. But before you know it, they've already added three signings. It's the end of the season. You didn't even hear about David Gill. You didn't even hear about the deal getting done. The amount of deals I've heard about, right, in the, in the mainstream industry, that David Gill, sorry, Ed Woodward, has done, messed up, is unbelievable. Manchester United, and a, a juggernaut like Manchester United, everything that gets released about Manchester United is intentional. Nothing comes out of Man United unless they want it to get out or allow it to get out. The, so what it tells me is that not everybody at Manchester United loves Ed Woodward because somebody in, within Man United cannot wait to tell the press how many times Ed Woodward has messed up the transfers. That's not a mistake. Mistakes don't happen at a juggernaut like Manchester United. It just does not happen. Once again, 20 February 2013. The day David Gill, it was announced that he was leaving the executive board. And that is the day that I feel Manchester United have never recovered from. And we come on to the Pogba problem. So poor Pogba... <clears throat> Of course, Man United's uh, world, re world record signing on fee. You know, what it meant was... Paul Pogba was being brought in to replace, I feel, two people that Man United have still not replaced, ever. They've never, ever replaced Roy Keane. And Man United fans will never tell you this. Because Kino has been quite a difficult character. But they'll never tell you this. But Man United have never replaced Roy Keane. The greatest midfielder the Premier League has ever seen. And there's still, there's always been something missing. There's always been something missing. But then Pogba had to fill probably the biggest shoes Man United have ever had to fill. Keane, their greatest player without, uh, ever without any doubt. I don't want to hear about George Best. I don't want to hear about Cristiano Ronaldo. Roy Keane embodied the football club. You know, Roy Keane was like having a manager on the field. And that's never happened again for Manchester United. So try and be poor Pogba. Pogba had to replace Keane. Who the, but that's a very deep-lying thing. Like he had to replace Roy Keane. That's not easy for anybody. I think it's almost impossible shoes to fill. But then he had to replace Fergie. And then he had to place David Gill because they've now spent this mountain of money. And generally, once again, companies are always talking to you. So you know who to blame, right, in companies as well. It's who's earning the most money. Who costs the most? They call it cost to company. Who, who has the largest cost to company? That's the person to blame. They won't tell you that, but actually they've already told you by applying that much money to Paul Pogba is that's the guy to blame. He is the most expensive in the world. 
So we expect him to fill Fergie's shoes, David Gill's shoes, make everything feel like United again. So within seven years, Man United lost Roy Keane, Sir Alex Ferguson, and David Gill. And United have never recovered. They've never had it as good as the treble season. Yes, they did do the double. And yes, they went three times in a row, but they did three times in a row when Keane was there, and it was never like that again. It's, they've never had the feel-good factor. They've never had the captain who the fans connected with. Gary Neville wasn't Roy Keane. Keane has never been replaced. Paul Pogba, right? He was a commercial deal. Is it any surprise that Adidas, the year before, signed a world record deal with Manchester United as the shirt sponsor? Pogba, the pin-up boy for Adidas, it's well reported now that actually Man United didn't fund the whole, whole deal. Adidas paid for part of the Pogba deal. So even though it's a world, world record fee, Man United probably uh, paid for 70% of the fee from what's been reported. So he's commercial business, Paul Pogba, because all the stats, everything, if, you, if you've been watching football, tell you Paul Pogba has never been the best player on his team. He's never been a leader on his team. So the Pogba problem is this. He is not good enough to be the leader of your football club, and there is no way he... I don't care how many shirts he sells. Jose Mourinho has seen through the lie. 29 million Instagram followers, 6 million Twitter followers, 7 million Facebook followers. Adidas started sponsoring Man United 2015. Surprise, surprise, the new Adidas pinup boy, Paul Pogba, arrives in a ridiculous deal. If you're objective, it's a ridiculous deal. Paul Pogba isn't worth 50 million. He's never done anything to justify anything close to that. And why do I say that? It's not because I hate Paul Pogba or Man United. Is no player, if you think of great players, Patrick Vieira, Roy Keane, Frank Lampard, Didier Drogba, think of all the greats, Thierry Henry, Robert Pires, None of these players need to be babysat. And Paul Pogba, his whole career, so far, at Juventus, they had to babysit him. And what do I mean by babysit? They couldn't make him the main player. So what you do is you put Arturo Vidal, you put Andrea Perlo, and you put Claudio Marchisio around him. Marchisio, Vidal, Perlo. So you babysit him, right? Is even they knew, like, this isn't the guy to make the main step. We've got to put some, some proper players around him. Because, actually, technically, Pogba's not great. Tactically, Pogba's not great. And Jose Mourinho has seen this. And Man United fans don't like that. Poor Pogba doesn't like that. But Pogba isn't everything that's advertised. And how do I know that? Is everywhere he goes, they have to babysit him. And by babysit, I mean you've got to put Marquisio around him. Right? You've got to put Perlo around him. You've got to put Vidal around him. And then he can shine. You don't need to babysit Roy Keane. Put anyone around him. Everyone's going to step up to Roy Keane's level or they're going to know about it. Poor Pogba. Tactically, he's nowhere. France even. 2016. Let's have a look. When Remember, uh, they had him as the main man. And then Deschamps learnt in the final that this isn't the guy. And now they had to babysit him again. And I mean, even at Euro 2016, they tried because they put Sissoko, they put Matuidi, they put Conte around him. And that wasn't enough. They didn't even play Matuidi then. They had Sissoko and, and then they tried to kind of let him go by just playing Sissoko and Conte next to him. But then I think, from what I've seen for the World Cup, they learnt. They, they turned Griezmann, they, they, they turned Griezmann into the main guy. And they said, this guy's not the guy. We're gonna ba- we have to babysit him again. And now you have to play Matuidi and Conte. So what that does is it took a lot of the attacking edge away from France. Because France, if you look, they only won 1-0, two nils here and there. They never thrashed anybody. So you couldn't play Anthony Martial, even though he wasn't at, in the squad. But you couldn't play Kingsley Coman. Because you had to babysit Paul Pogba. So you had to play Matuidi, Conte. People say, oh, you're just biased. You just don't like Man United. I say, okay, show, let, let, let's, look at, let's look at his record so far. People go, oh, he was unbelievable. 
at Juventus. And I say, was he? Was he really unbelievable? When you got Marquise you know, Vidal and then the greatest deep line playmaker of all time. And then Chiellini and Bonucci and Bazagli. And Reno Gattuso. Oh, well, excuse me, you've got to forget the right back. It'll come to me now. When you've got those guys, are you really the guy? Because Roy Keane was winning with Gary Neville, Phil Neville, and he was still winning. He had awful players. There were some awful players in that Man United team, and Roy Keane was still winning. Won six titles. Patrick Vieira had some very, very average guys with him. Ray Parler, not great. Gilberto, okay. But it, well, I'll take you to the promised land. But Paul Pogba left Juventus. So people, people are like, ah, oh, he's left Juventus. Now we'll see. They'll miss him. He left Juventus. They had got the same points the next season. 91 points. And then 91 points the next. And then 96 points the season after. They've scored more goals without him every season that he's been gone. So they've been better without Paul Pogba, actually. They got back to the Champions League final. How good is Paul Pogba, really? Even with all the babysitting in the world, when he was the mainstay, when they had the team around him, Euro 2016, he failed, dismally. If you're going to justify yourself as the world record player, you better make damn sure that you deliver us from evil every single time. And there is no track record for Paul Pogba doing that. That is Man United's problem, is they've invested a world record sum in a guy who's not quite the goods. He's not what's advertised. But once again, companies are talking to you all the time. Man United are telling you, we are not a commercial institute and not a football club. You don't have to like what I'm saying, but Jose Mourinho has seen it. Jose has seen it. He dropped him. And, he, and now he has to babysit him. Because now he has to play Herrera and Matic. Two guys who are tactically and technically outstanding. Because Pogba just can't be trusted to be the mainstay in the midfield. His technique's average. Tactically, he's woeful. He's woeful because everywhere they have to babysit him. You have to put two defensive mids with him all the time. Nobody ever had to babysit Michael Essien. He played two in the middle, Essien, three in the middle. Never had to babysit Frank Lampard. Nobody had to babysit Roy Keane. Patrick Vieira, play two in the middle, three in the middle, doesn't matter. They'll adjust. Pogba reminds me of a guy called Juan Sebastian Verón. Unbelievable player. Unbelievable player. Unbelievable technique. But tactically couldn't be trusted. Didn't work at Man United, didn't work at Chelsea. Because Fergie said he couldn't babysit the guy. The guy was everywhere. Pogba is everywhere. But he is not what's advertised. So Man United's biggest problem is that they're all in now. And Pogba is not as good as advertised. If you don't believe me, go and check it out. He left Juventus. They got better. They went back to the Champions League final. Man United have never been worse. And they've tried everything with him. Three at the back. Four at the back. Two in the middle. And eventually they're like, no, we have to babysit this guy. So what he's doing is he's nullifying the club. Because you can't play all the attackers you want. You've got to play two, three in midfield. Otherwise, Paul Pogba is a nightmare. Doesn't know where to be, when to be there. And he doesn't have the character to lead a football club. Don't believe me? Go and look at the Juventus numbers. He left. Juventus have never been better. That is my take on the poor Pogba situation. And I, I, I dare anybody to challenge that and change my mind. Poor Pogba is not as good as advertised. But he's a fantastic business decision. And I'll say it one last time. Companies are always talking to us. We just have to listen. And Man United have told you since 2013. Remember that day I told you? 20 February 2013. The day David Gill left Manchester United. And it was never the same. Right, so we're going to move on to the Spurs. Stadium shambles. My goodness. Got all the Arsenal fans. Man United fans. People can't wait to have their say. 
So I'm going to introduce a concept which you may or may not know. As I sip on my Kenyan tea. <clears throat> so this very famous guy, if you're into history, the first uh, Herodotus is, uh, you know, it's claimed that he's the first and original historian. But actually, if you look into it, there is a gentleman by the name of Thucydides. I'll tell you a little story about Thucydides. He wrote an interesting book on the uh, Peloponnesian Wars on which he served as a um, general. So as the Athenians and the Spartans wrestled for power. And anyway, so there's a concept called the Thucydides trap. Right? And this Thucydides trap proposes that when an old power, so the incumbent power, right, and the new power, there's a point in 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 in, in sort of uh, the, the the scale of events or the sequence of events where the new power and the old power have the same amount of power, but the new power is kind of seceding and going above the old power. And in the moment where they cross by, in that moment, there is tension, right? And that is called the Thucydides trap. When the, when the old power knows that the new power is coming and can actually feel the new power rising equal to and above their power. It's called the Thucydides trap. And I propose this is what is happening with Spurs. This is why people are so upset and just cannot wait. Couldn't wait to jump on the bandwagon. Ah, oh, what a disgrace. I can't believe their stadium. Oh my God, they should be fine, banned, points taken off. Oh my goodness, would you relax? It was twice the season. It's done now. What I think people hate, <laughs> and I'm no Spurs fan, what people hate is that they can see that Spurs have a plan and they are sticking to it. It makes Arsenal fans sick. It makes Arsenal fans sick that Spurs are going to transition to a stadium that is nicer than Arsenal's. And they're not going to have to take a financial hit. It makes Arsenal fans sick. It makes Man United fans sick. It makes Man City fans sick. Chelsea fans sick. Absolutely sick to the stomach. To think Spurs have a plan and they are sticking to it. So if you don't know what I'm talking about. It's called the Northum Northumberland Project. And Daniel Levy and his cronies... They pictured this um, from all reports in about 2007. And I think, you know, at that stage, nobody took Spurs seriously. I, I don't think anybody does at the moment. Nonetheless, that's a different conversation. Right, but the North Northumberland project is about an £850 million pound project in London. And it's apartments and it's, you know, this, that and the other. But it's, a, it's, it's changed the whole complex in around uh, the old White Hart Lane. So, project's about £850 million. Pounds, and the stadium's about £400 million of that. Give or take, with costs rising, it might be about £500 million. Take the Northumberland project up to closer to about a billion pounds. Right? And it makes people sick. Of course, Spurs ban them. Did you see the state of the pitch? They're embarrassing the league. And, oh, can't believe Wolves had to play on that. And it's because people know... That there's a new power rising. Right? And people are like, oh, the stadium, this and that. And let me tell you why people are threatened. Because you can actually see that Spurs had a plan. So we know in the latest reported financial earnings of Spurs, they've got a 10-year deal with the NFL. So that's guaranteed £100 million. Pounds, guaranteed. The new Facebook deal... From 2019 to 2022, that's new money, except, so not, not the Sky, not the BT deal. That's 200 million pounds that the Premier League clubs will be splitting. That's new money, completely new money. Facebook will be streaming football live in Asia for 200 million pounds. Southeast Asia, Thailand, Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia. From 2019 to 2022. 
They're going to get 20 games a season, along with Amazon. Amazon, we don't know quite what the figure is, but BT had to pay around 90 million for their 60 games. So it's going to be north of that. So you can be sure Amazon are, are, are now in over the next three years for 100 million. So Spurs are getting a cut of that. Spurs have the young, best young manager in football, undoubtedly. Maurizio Pochettino is as good as it gets. Real Madrid wants him. Barcelona wants him. Everybody wants him. He won't go to Barcelona, I don't think, with his ties with Espanyol. But that's a, a, that's a different conversation for a different time. But it hurts people because it looks like Spurs have a plan. They've got the best young manager in town. The financial model is solid. Daniel Levy is solid. And Spurs' pro, uh, progress will actually be expedited. Right? Because they live in London. They live in London. Everybody wants to live in London. Business is in London. Players want to live in London. Nobody wants to live in Manchester. Nobody wants to live in Liverpool. Get serious. So they're never going to have a problem attracting new sponsors, big sponsors. They are, the, they are in the height of business worldwide. The very center of the economic landscape in the world is foggy London town. They've just signed their two biggest assets onto long-term deals. Harry Kane, 2024. Deli Alli, 2024. Christian Eriksen, he's currently in negotiations. And believe you me, Daniel Levy, once he enters a negotiation, even Alex Ferguson says it. Toughest negotiator in town. When he gets into a negotiation, he usually wins. So the stadium, there's a financial plan to pay it off. Right? 10 years. Maximum. Maximum. And you can be sure they'll pay it off in five. Because Levy's got a plan. So everything I've just told you, they're going to be earning a guaranteed 100 million besides everything else. The last year, Spurs are reported to have earned 359 million pounds. Record income. Brand new TV deals coming. Spurs are going to pay their stadium off in five years. And then they enter a different stratosphere. And Arsenal fans don't know how to deal with it. Chelsea fans don't know how to deal with it. Man United fans don't know how to deal with it. And Liverpool fans, it makes them sick. It was a problem three times this year, guys. Ban them. Stop them. They're an embarrassment to the league. It was a problem three times. For goodness sake. But the problem isn't that Spurs had a bad pitch. The problem is that everybody, like Thucydides said, the Athenians, in the, at the point when they realized that the Spartans were seceding and rising above them in terms of power, they had to fight. And nobody likes that moment, but it's happening. People are watching Spurs transcend from mediocre and they're leaving Arsenal behind. To some extent, in the long term, I believe they'll leave Liverpool behind. And they don't like that. And people will say, there's no history but it's happening in front of your eyes. And the reason people are outraged is that Spurs have the best ownership model and they have a plan and they are sticking to it. My rough math says it'll take them about five years to pay it off. Plus minus 400 million, 500 million. Daniel Levy, there's a guaranteed, I've already listed the guaranteed 10-year NFL deal, Facebook, Amazon. That's about 100 million that Spurs will be making, which they aren't making this year, which was reported they, they made Record financial gains this year. Profits. They, I mean, £369 million pounds came into Spurs this year. That's £100 million more than the 2016 financial reportings. And it's never going to get less. The Premier League is not getting less popular. Spurs are on the fly. They have the best ownership model. And they just feel solid. You never hear from Daniel Levy. You never hear from him. But Pochettino keeps ticking along keeps giving these youngsters a chance and Spurs are on their way up. So people's problem isn't the fact that Spurs are embarrassing the league. They might tell you that's the problem. But deep down, everybody knows, especially Liverpool fans, especially Man United fans. And worst of all, their neighbours, the Arsenal, the Gooners. The Gooners know Spurs are transcending Arsenal. This is a long-term plan, 10-year NF deal, NFL deal, guaranteed 100 million pounds. 
Now that puts Spurs in America like no other club in the world. The new Spurs stadium, the only stadium in the world with that retractable sort of grass. And they'll have that synthetic pitch underneath for the NFL. Only stadium in the world. They will access the consumer market in the world that everybody wants to get into America like nobody else can do. The NFL has an exclusive deal. Only Tottenham Hotspur will have that cross-Atlantic relationship. That's the problem. So stop crying. Stop telling me, oh my goodness, they're embarrassing the league. They're not embarrassing the league. They're taking the league to another level. And don't let your, don't let your hate for something more solid. Look into it a bit more. I think people are upset because the Liverpool are getting left behind. Man United are getting left behind. And then the Gunas are being left behind. Tottenham Hotspur are going to be the biggest show in town. And people don't like it. Give it five years. You might think I'm crazy now. But they've got a plan and they are sticking to it. Daniel Levy is the best owner, without a doubt, in the English Premier League. Let's move over to Real Madrid and their situation. I mean, the, the Lopetegui situation is just, go with me here. One of the most ridiculous things that has ever happened in the history of sport. Go with me on this one. You know, if you've ever been in a relationship and your partner cheats on you, or you cheat on your partner, let's, uh, let, let's make it about the listener. Let's say you cheat on your partner. Very seldom is the partner upset that you cheated, actually. That's not, that's not the worst part about it. More often than not, the partner is upset that you cheated and you didn't hide it better. I'll say that again. You know, when you cheat on somebody, they're not upset that you cheated on them. Okay, fine, that's an element of it, of course. But actually, more often than not, it's, my God, you disrespect me enough not to hide it better. And Lopetegui was ridiculous from the beginning. Him, his management team, it was amateur hour from the beginning. The situation was doomed from the start. Four and a half months ago, Julien Lepetegui had the two dream jobs in the world. He was two days away from every Spaniard's dream and maybe any manager in the world's dream managing Spain at the World Cup. He'd won the under-19, he'd won the under-21 Euro, Euros, so he'd already tasted success and was a man, a company man, of course, for the Spanish FA. Four and a half months ago, he was two days away from managing Spain. Two days away, that's it. He was also the Real Madrid manager. On the 12th of June, 2018, he had two jobs. Four and a half months later, he has no jobs. He had the Real Madrid job and the Spain job at the same time. And everybody wants to feel sorry for him. Oh, Florentino Perez. Sure, he's, a, he's, a, he's always a big part of the, the circus that goes on at Real Madrid. You cannot deny that. He pays, he pays, he signs the checks. But on this one, I'm afraid Lopetegui is on his own. Do I feel anything for him? Absolutely not. What you need to do in this situation is be professional. You do your diligence. He didn't do his diligence. He got selfish. He was amateur. He was unprofessional. Surely at that level, and I, I, I've had to deal with this in, my, in, in, in the line of work I work with. You, you get Matt Real Madrid and the Spanish FA around a table. In fact, you let your lawyers deal with it. Everybody signs non-disclosures. You let the Spanish situation play itself out. It's the World Cup. You go through the World Cup. On the day Spain got knocked out or win the World Cup, you exit stage left. But instead, 
it's been an absolute shambles from the beginning. What is Lopetegui doing? Who's his PR team? Who's the management team? Who's his agent? Who, who's he dealing with at Real Madrid? Because at this level, nothing comes out unless you want it to come out. There should have been a non-disclosure. Everything should have happened behind closed doors. There should have been a non-disclosure to say, okay, you are the Real Madrid manager, but only after the World Cup. What's the difference? You get everybody around the table to sign non-disclosures. Right? It's quite simple, actually. It's, it's, very, it's a standard practice in sport, in, in life, in business. Non-disclosures are everywhere. But it was amateur hour right from the beginning. I heard the other day his father came out and said Real Madrid stole 50 goals from him. Uh, Florentino Perez and Cristiano Ronaldo have been falling out for two seasons. It was no secret that Ronaldo was out of here. He had his tax problems. Okay, fine. He wanted to get out of Spain for that because he wasn't getting the right treatment. He said that's another issue. But other than that, Perez and Ronaldo have been vying for power at Real Madrid and Perez wasn't having it anymore. Him and Ronaldo fallen apart. Florentino Perez is not a guy you cross. You cross him once, you're out of town. Ask every single man. Ask Fabio Capello. Ask all of them. Ask all of them. He doesn't care that Cristiano Ronaldo is the greatest player in the world. Or second greatest player in the world. Leo Messi, of course, is the greatest. It's not even close. But Ronaldo, is, he's Real Madrid's greatest of all time. There's no doubt about that. But at the drop of a hat, Florentino Perez says, you're out of here. Lopetegui didn't do his diligence. So no non-disclosure. You've embarrassed the Spanish FA. You've embarrassed yourself. You've embarrassed everybody in the deal. It's amateur hour from the beginning how you got the Real Madrid job. How did anybody else think it was going to go? Everybody is crazy to think this could have gone well. And then he wants to come out and say Real Madrid stole 50 goals from him. The Real Madrid deal to Juventus was done before the World Cup. Ronaldo was out the door well before the World Cup. After the Champions League uh, treble, he was gone. Zidane already knew that this was coming. Zidane left because he said, this squad needs freshening, refreshing. And Florentino said, no, I want to fund a new, he, he wants to put a new roof on the stadium. He said, you're going to try with the youngsters. So this is all information everybody else knew. Zinedine Zidane would never quit Real Madrid, which has been his second spiritual home for a good 20 years now. As player and coach. His kids still play there. He's, he's relocated his family to Madrid. Of course, he's from Marseille. Re Zinedine Zidane wouldn't quit Real Madrid unless there was a massive reason. And there's no ways after you've just won the third Champions League in a row, they're firing you. But Lopetegui got greedy. And that meant it was amateur hour. He did anything. And listen, if I'm the Real Madrid players, as soon as I saw how that went down, I'm worried. And I believe this is what happened. A man who allows himself to be bullied and made to look the fool like that is not a man who can handle Sergio Ramos, Tony Cruz, Luka Modric, Karim Benzema, Marcelo. A man who conducts himself like Lopetegui did for this entire deal, ordeal, in fact, it's an ordeal. He's not the guy. And I think the Real Madrid players saw that straight away. If I can see it, we can see it. They saw it straight away. And there's no ways you're going to be able to get a Real Madrid dressing room of that magnitude to follow you if you can't even do your diligence properly. These guys aren't idiots. Sports stars don't follow anybody. That's why there's so few good coaches, great coaches in the world. Hard leadership is hard to find. And the way Lopetegui handled the transition from Spain to Real Madrid was ridiculous. It was always going to be a train smash. It was amateur hour from the get-go. Everybody's proposing Antonio Conte as the replacement. I don't see it. It would never work. Lopetegui, a mess. But you want a real mess. You want Sergio Ramos and Antonio Conte in the same dressing room. Sergio Ramos, of course, it's been well documented, having massive fights with Florentino Perez as we speak. 
The concern there is uh, Sergio Ramos is the most powerful man at Real Madrid right now. He's got the dressing room in the palm of his hands. You can understand why he's one of the most charismatic characters football's ever had. And in my eyes, the greatest defender of this generation. Post Maldini, post Cannavaro. He is the greatest defender we have seen in the last 15 years. Post Maldini. That's important to hear. So Maldini retired, what, 2006? It's 12 years ago. But in the last 15 years, you'd have to say Sergio Ramos. He's the greatest defender of his generation, no doubt. Don't put Maldini and Cannavaro in that conversation because they're in a different league. Am I saying Sergio Ramos is Lillian Turam? No. Am I saying he's... Paolo Maldini, no. Is he, am I saying he's Alessandro Nesta? No. But of this generation, he is the greatest. And Sergio Ramos has character. He's a leader. And the dressing room follows him. And there's problems at Real Madrid right now. And Ramos is king. Antonio Conte will not tolerate that. We saw that with Diego Costa. Didn't work out. Big personalities, Diego, Diego Costa. One season, all right, thanks, you're out of here. Sergio Ramos is a different beast. If people think Diego Costa is an animal, Sergio Ramos is a different animal. And he's won, so you can't tell him anything. Diego Costa hasn't won very much. Sergio Ramos, everywhere he's gone, he'll tell you, I am the common denominator. Where I go, the gold goes. Spain, Euros. He became captain, World Cups. They've been unbelievable under Sergio Ramos. Three in a row. He'll tell you I've been El Capitan three in a row at Real Madrid, Champions League. Casillas, of course, World Cup captain. But Euros, we know what this thing is. Sergio Ramos is the guy. But you want real trouble. You want big time trouble. Put Antonio Conte and Sergio Ramos in one dressing room. I don't see it. I see Arsene Wenger as the transition to Solari as the next manager. I think Arsene Wenger is more of a diplomat. So the fans would almost accept a season and a half of not great, but Wenger will get it done. It'll be classy. The club will be sort of get the right PR image and Florentino will have a puppet. Florentino Perez and Antonio Conte, that is not going to work. I think it's more likely that Jose Mourinho comes back than Antonio Conte gets the job. To me, it is more likely that way. Why do I say that? Better the beast you know than one you've got to tame. Because Florentino Perez is going to have to tame Antonio Conte, a different beast. He's a different beast. Antonio Conte is a different animal. We saw that at Chelsea. And if Roman Abramovich couldn't do it, I don't know if Florentino is the guy. I just don't. Antonio Conte is a different level from Jose Mourinho. He's off his rocker. Fantastic, fantastic manager, but he needs the right type of ownership. Florentino Perez is not about that business. He doesn't want that action. And trust me, Sergio Ramos, Antonio Conte, train smash. Lopetegui is lost. He was lost from the beginning. He is now lost. I'll say it again. Four and a half months ago, he had the two dream jobs in world football. And just being amateur cost him those the dream jobs within four and a half months you will not blame Real Madrid for selling Cristiano Ronaldo that happened well before your deal Lopetegui knew he was the third choice for Real Madrid he still took the job he got greedy he was amateur and four and a half months later he's out of a job any empathy for him absolutely not conduct yourself like a professional you're 52, not 22. Get it together. Real Madrid will be fine. They'll have Solari for, for, I think, the rest of the season. Or interim can only be two weeks according to Spanish rules. So I think they'll have Solari for the rest of the season now. They've uh, they've been all right. Won 5-0, 6-0 last night in the Champions League, I think. And it's been two good wins in a row. Lopetegui, absolutely lost. And lastly, we're going to talk about my spring box. Of course, the Owen Farrell tackle 
everyone's up in arms. Oh my goodness, how could Angus Gardner miss that tackle? That's what cost us the game, blah, blah, blah. The Springboks are always, the refs are always against them, blah, blah, blah. I'm tired. I'm tired of South Africans in that attitude. Like, how long can you blame the ref? <laughs> it's like, it's different refs, you know? Like, you can't blame every ref. The, com the common denominator is that the Springboks are always in close games that we lose over the last, like, 15 years, right? The refs aren't the common denominator. It's like, you can't blame six different refs for cheating us. Like, get serious, people. I love the Springboks, not that much. Like, I'm not blinded by that much. I, I, I'm a fanatic, but come on. Just, uh, let's be reasonable here. So a lot of people have overlooked what I think cost the Springboks the game. They've overlooked it, right? And it's something called pedigree. All right? It's called pedigree. So, I don't know if people are into horses. But I have a few friends uh, from when I was younger there into horses. And I and two, two of my very good friends are horse trainers. And they always tell me, oh, whenever you're looking for a new horse or you, or you hear of a new horse, is you need to check the pedigree. And the best way to do that is to look at the horse's genes. But that's not enough, is I need to see the mom and the dad of the horse if they're still alive, right? You need to see the parents of the horse because you need to know where that stock's coming from. Is the father a champion horse, right? It's called pedigree. It's called pedigree. That's what you need to see. You need to see the pedigree of somebody if you want to predict if they can give you certain results. And that's what horse trainers do before they, they tell you, okay, this will be a dressage champion or, you know, going to win the Kentucky Derby or whatever it's going to be. You need to see the pedigree. That's why you pick a horse. And that's how you should pick a sportsman. What's their track record? How long have they been doing what they, they've been doing at a high level? What are their fundamentals? Who taught them the fundamentals? How long did they learn the fundamentals for? What school did they go to? Like, these things are important. I don't care what you say. People can get emotional. Like, everybody deserves a chance. No. You need pedigree. You need the fundamentals to be instilled through certain institutions. That's just how it is. You don't have to like it. All right? Owen Farrell's tackle didn't cost the Springboks. I don't care about Owen Farrell's tackle. Yeah, it was a yellow card. It was a, 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 like a terrible decision. I found it hilarious that Russi had a, a fit in the press about that. Like, he, Russi had actual reason to have a fit. But he's pointing the finger at the wrong person and the wrong people. It's not Angus Gardner who cost the Springboks the game. What are you talking about? Like, Russi, take some responsibility, man. What's he talking about? Owen Farrell's tackle cost them the game. If that's the legal way to tackle. I, I kind of like the banter, but I mean, if he's being serious. And I'm kind of picking up, he's, he, he was angry. I think he's angry at the ref. Should be angry at Pollard missing a sitter from the halfway line. That's who he should be angry at. <laughs> right? But Farrell's tackle didn't cost the Springboks the game. That's not what cost us the game. There's deeper issues that cost us. And people don't want to talk about it. Because they're the spring box. And it's like, whoa, well, Rusty's back. Everything's fine. And it's a sensitive one. Kosia Kolisi, he's being lauded as the, like, the next Richie McCall, even though he's nowhere near that. I've never liked him as an international rugby player, but anyway, he's okay. He's fine. I can deal with him. But what cost the Springboks is horrendous leadership on the pitch. It's got nothing to do with Angus Gardner. It's got nothing to do with Owen Farrell's tackle. It's got nothing to do with any of that. Horrendous leadership on the pitch. That's what wins you games. In the big moments, right, is what are the decisions you make when it's crunch time? With horses, particularly in dressage. What are the decisions can the horse deliver when it's crunch time? 
That's what it's about. That's why you need to look at pedigree. And none of our players have international pedigree. I don't care that Itzabeth has played 100 tests. He's not an international lock. He never has been. After 70 tests or whatever he's played, he should be a legend. Even Elizabeth plays like he's in his 10th game. Owen oh, Farrell's tackle didn't cost the Springboks. Horrendous leadership on the pitch. And I'm afraid there's no coaching for that. People say, what do you mean by that? England were down to 10 men. Uh, it's, excuse me, 14 men. You've got a line out. Oh, you've got a penalty 10 meters out. You kick it for the line out. Marks who I'll get to you misses the first throw. Like, okay. The pack's down to seven. You're 10 meters out. Take the scrum. Because basics. Take the scrum. What do they do? Kick it for the line out again. Who's making those decisions? And my biggest problem with Springbok rugby, not just now. Anybody who knows me knows my feeling. There's too many boneheads. Too many boneheads in the Springbok rugby team. The pack was filled once again. And this has been my biggest problem with Rossi when he came back. It was my biggest problem with Alistair Kutzier. It was my biggest problem with Heineke Mayer before that. Too many boneheads. You can only have so many gorillas and boneheads in a team. Rugby isn't that anymore. It just isn't. This notion that Peter Steph de Toy is a blindside flank is so crazy to me. And you'll notice all the praise for Peter Steph de Toy at flank. Oh, look how many tackles he made. He's unbelievable. Look at his work rate. Look at his ball carrying. That's all gorilla stuff. It's not rugby. It's not modern day rugby. I've never heard Jerry Collins be praised for his... his his tackle rate. Never. I never heard anybody say, oh, Jerry Collins, his tackle rate. But he did. Unbelievable tackle rate. Unbelievable work rate. Unbelievable ball carrier. Rodney Soyalo. I expect international players to do that. Stop telling me about work rate and tackle rate. I, like, I expect that. You should... As a blindside flank at international rugby, you should be carrying the ball eight times a game over the game line, a minimum of that. I should be making five driving tackles backwards. Like, why, why are we praising people for that? Like, that's a special characteristic. Like, let this sink in, right? Dwayne Vermeulen... Peter Steph Detoy, Ibn Itzabeth, Franz Malherba, Sia Kalisi, and Malcolm Marks all in one pack. Those are all boneheads in my, in my view. None of those are thinking rugby players. For Milan, Peter Steph Detoy, Itzabeth, Franz Malherba, Kalisi, and Marks. They're all boneheads. They're all about the physical contact, the big hits, the work rate, the, the rah, rah, rah. None of those are finesse players. For Milan, Steph de Toy, Etzebeth, Malerba, Colisi, and Marks. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six. Six of your eight. Six of your eight are boneheads in international rugby in 2018. That's what cost the Springboks against England. Boneheaded moves. Go for the line out again. We're going to shove them over. No, make the right decision. You know what the All Blacks do there? Is, oh my goodness, we're a man up in the scrum. What we're going to do is we're going to shove England back. And if they don't take the pressure, because or, or Springboks were already dominating the scrums eight on eight. They won't be able to take the pressure. And you know what happens? Is you either get penalty try or they get another man sent off. And then it's 15 on 30. Because generally what happens when, when they don't take the pressure 
is the tight head generally. The tight head generally, because he doesn't hold the bind and he pops up because he can't take the pressure, then the tight head gets sent off. And then we and then it's non-contested scrums and it's 13. 15 on 13. The boneheadedness of the spring box cost them the game. Kitsoff and Whiteley are the only thinking players we've got. Warren Whiteley is the only world class forward that was in that squad. Jean-Luc Dupre, who we'll talk about later, for me, he's, a, he's the Rolls Royce. But Warren Whiteley is the only world class player trapped amongst some very average rugby players. But they're huge and they can hand off and they've got work rate. Like that should matter to me. I don't care about that. I expect that. There's base level numbers that you have to hit to be an international rugby player. I don't care who you are. And the argument for Peter Steph Tatoy, of course, being at flank, is the defensive line out. And it worked with Juan Smith in 2007. Don't compare Peter Steph Tatoy to Juan Smith, please. Juan Smith's the greatest, uh, possibly the greatest springbok of all time in my mind. But definitely the greatest forward the springboks have ever had. So please don't compare Peter Steph to Toy. And Jean Smith was a thinker and a captain and a leader. So he wasn't a bonehead. Jean Smith was far from. He was one of the most sophisticated, loose forwards South African rugby's ever had. He was a modern rugby player. He could bully you, but then he'd offload. He'd do all of the subtle things. And you never heard about his numbers, but he was the second best line-out uh, something people may or may not know, second best line out play in 2007 at the World Cup after Victor Matfield in the entire tournament. Look up the numbers. I'm not making it up. So it was an all round package. Please don't put Peter Steph to toy in that conversation. Peter Steph to toy should be a lock. He's unbelievably slow. Like it's unbelievable, it's unbearable. We have no dynamism, but we're boneheads. We like the boneheads. Big, strong, fast. Look at the work rate. I don't care about that. I expect that. Whiteley is the only international class, world-class rugby player we have in that pack. I like Kitsoff. He's a thinker. He's not just a thumper. For Mielin, Peter Seftatoy, Etzebeth, Malerba, Colisi, Marks. Six of eight boneheads. That's what cost the Springboks. Jean-Luc Dupré has to come back. Because he is a genuine Rolls Royce. He's, he's, I think he's as good as we've got. He's unbelievable. He's the perfect mesh. He's as close to Kieran Reid as I've seen since Kieran Reid. I don't know how else to put it. Jean-Luc Dupré is the perfect mix. Thinking rugby player. Looking to keep the ball alive. Runs unbelievable support lines. Great pace. Great dynamism. And the physicality, of course, you don't, you, uh, you don't have to question that. And here's the real thing that cost the Springboks. And people are not willing to accept it, so I'm going to keep saying it. Malcolm Marx is not an international hooker. I'm not surprised that he missed those lineouts. I don't know why people are surprised. I'm not surprised at all that he missed those lineouts. I expect it. Because you don't get to see how good a guy is when there's no pressure. Right? He missed the lineouts when it's crunch time. He missed the lineouts when it's crunch time. And in 10 months' time, that's the semi-final against Australia. It's not just a, an end-of-year test against England. And it'll happen again because Malcolm Marks doesn't have the pedigree. He doesn't have the pedigree to be a hooker. He's not an international hooker. He can't throw in the line-out. He can't scrum because in high school, he played blank. Stop telling me about his ball fetching. I don't care about that. He's not a fetcher. I don't, why are you telling me about his fetching? Like, congratulations, you're a great flank. Like, oh, you're Richie McCaw. Scrum and throw the ball in the line out. Everything else is... That's the chandelier. That's the art on the wall. But you get paid to hook the ball in the scrum. <laughs> And throw it in the line out. And Malcolm Marks can't do those things at a high level. That's what cost the Springbok. Malcolm Marks overshot two line outs when they were down to 14 men. In the 22. Can't have boneheads. You can't have just boneheads. 
Sad part is Rossi won't change now. The World Cup's too close. I don't think Rossi Erasmus wants this job long term. So this is what he's going to do. So don't tell me Farrell's tackle cost. I don't care about Angus Gardner. That's not what cost us. The Springboks should have been 21, maybe maybe 28 points up in the first half. But because we're boneheads, we didn't make the right decision when it counted. We overthrow the line out because we have a flank at the hooker. That's what cost the Springboks. Stop telling me about Angus Gardner. Stop telling me about Owen Farrell's no-arm tackle. He should have been suspended for that, yes. But that's not why the Springboks lost. Rassi Erasmus shouldn't be having a fit at the referee. He should be having a fit at his own fly-off who can't kick, dictate a, a rugby game, which is a conversation for another time. But more importantly, stop picking boneheads. Sir Khaleesi is not a leader. He's not the Springbok captain. I don't care what anybody says. He can't control those boneheads. We saw it on Saturday. Sia, he got bullied into taking two ridiculous lineouts. When the right decision is slow down, they're down to seven in the pack. We push them, we get penalties, eventually penalty try, or you get one of their men sent off. Because that's what happens over and over. That's what the All Blacks do, is once you have the upper hand, is you turn the screw. But when you have boneheads, you make egotistical decisions. Oh, we're going to maul them over. It's embarrassing. It is embarrassing that Rassi and South African rugby public are angry at the ref. It's not about the ref. It's about us. Let's start looking in-house and let's start picking cerebral thinking rugby players. Ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Springbok rugby, it's embarrassing what happened this week. And that press conference was embarrassing, blaming the ref as though he cost us the game. Malcolm Marks and the boneheads in our pack. Far too many boneheads in our pack cost us the rugby game. That's what cost us the game. They'll play France this weekend. I imagine they, that they'll beat France because you can bully France. But Rassi, I'm afraid, won't change now. Folks, so it's bonehead city right up until the World Cup. There's no way we're beating, we're beating the All Blacks in the World Cup. And I don't, I don't think we'll beat Ireland. And I have no respect for Northern Hemisphere rugby. But we won't beat Ireland because the, the Springboks, if you can't bully a team, they have no plan B. And you can't bully Ireland. All of these other teams, I think when we have our proper back line, you can bully them. Even in the back line. Too many boneheads. But I don't want to get into that. So Springbok Rugby, get it together. Rossi Erasmus, get it together. Stop blaming referees. Stop blaming everybody else. Start blaming yourself. Rossi, it falls on your head. You are the coach. You pick a flank at hooker. You pick boneheads. You pick Sia Colise as the captain. And they failed you in the crunch moments. So it's on Rossi Erasmus. And for me, it is on Sio Colisi. He failed to make the right decision at the right time. I don't want to hear anything else. You are the captain. It falls on your head. He gets all the credit when things go well. You have to, you have to take all the responsibility when all things go wrong. Same for Rassi Rasmus. He's got all the credit for the New Zealand win. He has to take all of the responsibility. It's got nothing to do with the ref. Should have been out of sight. You pick the fly half, he can't kick. He missed a sit from the halfway line. So that's my take. Not Farrell. The Farrell tackle has nothing to do with it. And that's from the bleachers for this week. Look forward to hearing back from everybody. Thank you so much for listening. See you tomorrow.